So what I'm going to talk about um, this session is about median finding algorithms. <coughs> Okay, so um, Professor Pandurangan talked about finding min and second min, or min and max. In the morning he talked about min and max and went through very careful analysis to give a 3n by 2 minus 2 bound. Okay. The same thing will work, yeah, okay. So suppose I want to find max and second max. Can somebody give me an algorithm? Okay, max and second max. This is after lunch, I have a job of waking you up, so I'm not going to move until somebody gives me an answer. I want to find, give me a simple pseudocode three line algorithm which finds maximum and second maximum. Do sorting and take, okay. Okay, finding second max. Sort and take the you know element in position two, right? In fact, we can do this even for max, right? How much time will this take? How much time? N square, n log n. This is like breaking a peanut with a hammer. Okay, you can just do this, and I'm I'm just asking you for one element. You say okay, sort it. And Obviously, this is an inefficient algorithm. Somebody else, give me a different algorithm. Yes, start with the first two numbers, decide which is the maximum and the second maximum, and keep track of. Uh, exactly. So you start with some, let's say, find compare a1 and a2, and let's say, if a1 is greater than a2, then we say max is a1, and maybe second max is a2. Otherwise, max is a2, and second max is a1. And then you have a, a loop running over all the elements, other elements, doing what? Okay, first we can compare it with max. Okay. And uh, if, it, if it doesn't turn out to be the maximum, then we compare it with Right. So how much, uh, what will be the worst case number of comparisons here? Two for each. In the worst case, because you may have to end up with comparing with both. So two into n minus two plus one this comparison, right? So this is like 2n minus 3 to find the second max, okay? Now, that's fine, okay? Now, um, if I want to find the third max, what do you do? Do the same thing, right? Keep three elements, run through the loop. You might end up, you know, three into n minus three plus one, and so on. So it's like if I want the case from the top, then roughly this algorithm would be something like k times n comparisons, right? So is that the best we can do? Can we do better? Well, um, let's just go back to f second finding second max and see whether there is a better algorithm. Yeah. So what do you do? So let's let's go back to max finding. Give me a different algorithm for finding max. One algorithm is okay. I keep I make the first element as the largest, then temporarily go through the loop, comparing everybody with this, and then you know I get the max. That's again n minus one comparisons, sort of a sequence. Can you think of a different algorithm for it? Take pair of max and then for this max, then take a pair of max. Yeah. So this is the, this is like uh, running a tournament. I want to. You know, run a tennis tournament and, and pick the champion. You know, I'm not going to play one, you know, I want to do it in parallel and a few number of days, as few days as possible. So I'm not going to wait for the winner of the first match and then play the next one. I can parallelly, you know, pair them up. I find, compare them all and then the winner of these first round will move to the next round, pair them up and keep going. Finally, I get my winner. How many comparisons will that take? Okay. 
okay, I mean, you have to worry about what if n is odd or if it's, you know, or it becomes odd somewhere in the middle and all that kind of thing, okay. Now, Pandurangan did go very details of floors and ceilings and Vikram and I are happily avoiding and we worry only about, assume n is a nice number, power of 2 and all that kind of thing. Then, how many comparisons? Let's see, how many comparisons in the first round? n by 2. How many in the next round? n by 4, n by 8, and you add them all, what do you get? n minus 1 again. It's a, it's a geometric series, so it's also giving you n minus 1. Okay? So you have a, a tournament like this. So you have this, pair them up, moving to the next round, and finally, you know, this is the finals, and this guy is declared as a winner. Now, normally in such tournaments, the, the runner-up of the finals is also declared as the, uh, as the second champion or something, right? That's obviously not correct. Can I, can I just say that, oh, you know, play, this is some X and Y, and whichever is larger is the largest at this point, and whichever is smaller is the second largest, is what is normally declared in, when you run tournaments, okay? Now, several people are shaking their heads. So obviously this doesn't work, right? Can be, yeah. What's example? Yeah. So I might have. Like this, the winner moves here, and then eight. 4 and 8, so 8 is the largest number, and 4 is far from being the second largest. In fact, you know, there are some several others which are larger than 4. Okay? So it was um, Lewis Carroll, who is the author of you know, Alice in Wonderland, who seemed to have these three shows that pointed out the unfair method of declaring the runner-up of the finals as the second largest, and that opened up the whole thing about finding Okay, so, so given all this, suppose I've run a tournament, I've spent n minus 1 comparisons. Now I want to find the second largest, what should I do? With this information, what I have on the tree, which, which has stored the outcome of the comparisons I have made, I want to find the second largest. Okay, Did anybody else get that? So who are the candidates for the second largest? Let's see, right? Um, anybody who played against the largest in the first round, think of it as a first round tournament you've done. Anybody who, who lost to the, the largest, got eliminated, that person can be a candidate for second largest. Why? Why? Is it easy to see? Well, anybody else is not a candidate for second largest is easy to see. Why? Because they got eliminated because they played with somebody else who lost to the largest. Okay? That means there are at least two guys above them, so they cannot be second largest. So the only candidate for the second largest are all the numbers that played against and lost with the largest. So with this tree of information, if I have, you know, 8 is declared winner, then my candidates for second largest, somebody who played with 8, somebody who played with 6, some, or somebody played with 8 in the previous round, somebody who played with 8 in the first round, these are all the candidates, and now I just go and find the maximum among them, and I'll get the second largest. How many candidates are there? Log n, right? One in each round, there are log n rounds, so what you can get is by using this algorithm, you get right? you, you run this tournament and then you know of course it requires certain bookkeeping I have to remember things and so on you know ignoring those details I just need there are only login candidates I can keep track of them and find the maximum among them and I get my second largest now this whole thing again can be applied if I want the third largest okay more bookkeeping is required gets messy, but well, there's a very clean way of doing the whole thing um, to find kth largest in k log n comparisons. Does anyone know how to do that? Order k log n, I'm ignoring. Hmm? Yeah. 
So what you do is build a heap. You know, if you know what it is, fine. If you don't know, don't worry about it. It's a, it's a, it's a way of storing this bookkeeping information. So you build a heap, which can be done in linear time. In linear number of comparisons, you can build a heap. And then you just delete max, delete max k times. And each one takes k log n times, so you get k log n. Okay, so in general, you can you know you can build a heap using about two n comparisons, for so build a heap, and then do delete max, and you get you get your kth largest. But it, you actually get a lot more. All I want, suppose, is only the kth largest. I also get the largest, the second largest, third largest, and everything up to k. Okay. So this um, is still better than the naive, which simply said, you know, go over these guys k times, and you know, pick some k elements as candidates and run this. That was k n, and this is like k log n. Okay. So k small, three, four, it's fine. It's all linear time. But if I'm talking about k close to median, you know, n by two or n by ten or some such thing, then that algorithm is an n log n algorithm. Now, so the question which was open, I mean, which was an interesting question in 1970s when people are doing large amount of data processing and all that, is that can you actually find the median without sorting? Of course, I mean, yes, you can find it without really sorting, I found it, but, you know, can you do substantially better than n log n time? In particular, is there a linear time algorithm for median? Okay. So this was a question that was asked in 1970s. and um, in 1973, there are five authors, Blum, Floyd, Pratt, Rivest, and Tarzan. It's sometimes called BFPRT algorithm. They showed that you can find Now, just median any k largest for any k in order n time. Okay. Now, we check that except Prot, all of them have won Turing awards. You know, Bloom, Floyd, Rivest, Tarjan. This is the highest award in computer science. So it required not for this work, of course, but the point is that it required these five great minds to get together and come up with the linear time algorithm. And this is uh, you know a textbook stuff now. You know you all learn in your third year course, or some such thing. Okay, so the point of my uh, session in the next half an hour or so is to go back to those time of 1970s when this algorithm was not there, get into their heads and see how they designed this algorithm. Okay, so you I mean this is one of the complicated algorithms you will see in your early algorithms course. You know you'll have this big picture. People would have seen some blocks of five, median of median, all kinds of things, and then do some various parameter manipulation, they got this linear time algorithm. But armed with all we learned today morning about recurrences and divide and conquer and all that, that was the thing that was available at that time. You know, I reverse engineer the algorithm and, and you know, sort of explain you how they arrived at this algorithm. Okay, so that's the point of my session today. Okay. So let's just go back here. I'm after finding, getting a linear time algorithm. Let me just go and look at these recurrences and see what gives me linear time, right? So I'm going to go from here. Not, you know, here is an algorithm analyzed. No, I'm not going to do that. I want to get a linear time algorithm for this problem. Let's look at some recurrence that gives me that, okay? So here is, let's look at this recurrence. Um, yeah, so let's say dn. Well, no, let's keep to cn. So d of n is basically some linear function, c of n, and a is 1. Let's look at this recurrence relation, and the master theorem tells you that n, so what is alpha? What is alpha here? Log a to the base b. What is it? Zero. 
yes, 0, a is 1, right, a is 1, so log a to the base, whatever b is, log of 1 is 0, so my alpha is 0, so the, the function, what, is, what do you mean calling that function? Watershed function. Watershed function, I was hearing it first time. So that's n to the alpha, which is like 1. Okay, that's the function. And what are we comparing it with? D of n, which is linear. Right? Some Cn. And it falls into this because D of n is omega n to the alpha plus epsilon because n to the alpha is this one. It's much more than the constant, which is what this driving function is. So T of n is order D of n, which is order n. Okay, so here is a clue for a recurrence relation that gives me a linear time algorithm. Okay, so I want to get, so what does this tell me? That in linear time, I want to um, reduce the problem to a recursive problem of a fraction of the input. Okay, in other words, in linear time, I want to throw away a fraction of the input. If I manage to do that, then I have a linear time algorithm. Okay, in linear time, throw away a fraction of the input and reduce to a recursive problem on this remaining input. Okay, so let's write that down. Okay, so so. reduce the problem or recursively on an input of size n by b. Some fraction, okay, whatever. If you, if you manage to do that, we fall into this recurrence and you have a linear time. Okay. So this was something available to them at that time. They had seen these recurrences and solutions. Okay, so this is what we need to get it. Okay. The other thing we know is some version of quick sort for finding median. Okay. So what is how does quick sort works? Well, you just pick a random element, partition all elements into you know pull them less than that, greater than that, and recursively sort each portion, and it works well on the average. If I want to you know adapt some sort of a similar idea for Finding the median, what should I do? Let's um, write this, right? So find a random element. Remember, now our goal is not to sort, but to find some kth smallest element, OK? Because I think I'm going to just talk about kth, because in the recursive situation, I may not necessarily be finding median, but some other element of some rank k. So find a random element x. Partition all elements with respect to x. Okay, so my entire list is split into l less than x, x, l greater than x. Okay, let's assume all elements are distinct and you don't have to worry about tie breaking and all that. So this is the next step. Now what should I do? What, what is the recursive step? I want to find the kth smallest element. Okay, I'm comfortable smallest. It doesn't really matter. Let's say kth smallest element. That means kth from the left in the increasing order. So what should I do? See the size of. So if then. What can you say? X is the answer. X is the kth smallest element. What is the kth smallest element? They're exactly k minus L. If you are lucky, and it turns out, I picked a random element, found its rank. I compared by comparing that with everybody else. And if L is equal to n, return x. Else if. Then I want to find 
I want a recurse in this portion. My kth smallest is inside here, right? So return or basically I want to find the kth smallest in the list L, then return kth smallest and else. Otherwise, this L, so what I have is, suppose this is very small, it's less than or equal to find So in that list, go and find an element of this rank in that right portion. So it's a recursive algorithm. Okay, let's. Um, so how much time does it take on this step? Uh, minus one. Hmm? Ah, okay. How many comparisons are made here? Order of n, actually n, n minus 1 because x is compared with everybody else. So this is an order n step. Remember this is a goal. Okay. So I have, I have done a partitioning, I have done some linear time and I am into a recursive problem. Okay. The only problem is that I don't have a control on this sizes. I mean I would be lucky and I am done if, if I manage to throw away a fraction of the input in this process. But if this was a random element, I don't know. It could be the smallest element. It could be the second smallest element. So I just end up throwing one element and you know everything else is there in my recursive thing. So that's so this is not good enough, but it it's it's not very hard to see that it works very well on the average because you know I'm just picking a random element. You know what is the chance that it is in this range, let's say You know, this is this is an element of rank n by 10. This is an element of rank 9 by 10. And I pick a random element. What is the probability that it's going to fall here? Hmm? So you know, 8n by 10 out of n. So it's like 4 by 5. Very high probability it's going to because if it falls here, I'm already done because I end up throwing. Depending on whichever side recurs, either I recurs here or there, either I get to throw away this portion or get to throw away this portion. So I'm I'm throwing away a fraction of the elements. Okay, and that happens with very high probability. And so one can actually do a, a formal analysis of this and show that expected running time of this is linear. Okay, because of this exact, you know, const linear time and a fraction of the input is where I'm recursing. But now you know I'm talking about working for worst case. So what I want is, um, so I want these portions where I am recursing to be is such that some fraction of the elements are thrown away. Okay? So essentially what I would want is instead of, okay, now instead of randomization algorithm, I'm talking about deterministic step, what I would want is find an element of rank between yeah, for 3n by 10 and 7n by 10 in some cn time. Okay, I, mean, I could just use any fraction here for that matter. Suppose, okay, so what I wanted this element I picked to be that in both sides of the element, I should have some fraction of the elements. So that when I find the rank, partition it and recurse, I end up throwing at least a fraction of the element. So, so let's say I manage to find an element whose rank, I don't know, you know for, some, for some reason I don't know where, what exactly its rank, I have to uh, run this step to find it. But I have a pretty good hunch that it is suppose between 3n by 10 and 7n by, by 10 rank of that element. If I manage to find an x in this range, in this step, in linear time, then after this partitioning, wherever I recurse, 
I, I, I get to throw away at least this portion or that portion and I am in business, I, I get into this recurrence, I get a linear term. Okay? So this was their first approach. Okay? And the reason they felt it's possible is oh this random pivot thing works, so maybe I want to find in linear time um, an algorithm whose rank is you know not necessarily 3n by 10 and 7n by 10 but some fraction, some n by b and you know another n by c or something like that. And they did not succeed in finding such a thing in linear time because it amounts to again finding another kth smallest element and you know that's the problem we started off with. Okay, so they went back and looked at this recurrence again. Okay, well you know this recurrence doesn't give me a linear. I mean, I would like this recurrence to give uh, you know get me an algorithm of that type, but somehow that didn't give. But let's see, can I extend this recurrence and still achieve? linear time. Okay? So they tried the following. Okay, so this is one. Let's write T of n okay in the morning recurrences were all you know the problem was divided into almost the same sizes. But suppose I have a recurrence of this form, what condition should I satisfy on the A and B to get a linear time here? Okay. Um, suppose 1 by A plus 1 by B is equal to 1, then what do you know? Do you, do you have an example? of such a recurrence you have seen. Is there a recurrence you saw in the morning? It is looking like this, but 1 by a and 1 by b equal to 1, merge sort, right, half plus half, two problems of size n by 2 and that was not giving us linear time, that was n log n, right. So. 1 by a plus 1 by b equal to 1, actually one can prove that it does, it actually gives you n log n, but suppose it is strictly less than 1. Then one can prove that this recurrence holds to linear time. Okay? I will sketch the proof using one more method than whatever you have seen in the morning, just by something which we know induction. So I'm going to guess that if this is a linear time. I mean, there is a base case and all that. We will guess that this recurrence solves to linear time and, and try and prove by induction that it is linear time. Okay, and see where we critically use the fact that this is strictly less than one. Okay, so proving by induction is just easy, right? So, and base case would be like you know, t of n is some large constant for n less than or equal to another big constant. Okay, that's a base case. So how do so the induction step, what do I want to show? Uh, I should use k um, alpha n for a constant alpha. This is the claim. Okay, so how do I prove by induction step? Well, assume the induction hypothesis, then what do I need to show? Tell me. What do I need to show? What do, how do I, so I have this recurrence relation. I want to show that T of n is less than or equal to some constant alpha times n. And let's assume it to be the case for small values of n, smaller values of n. That means it's true for this, or this. Okay, I'm trying to use this, right? And this. Okay. So to show what alpha k n by a plus alpha k n by b plus c n, I want it to be less than or equal to k. Yes, are you with me? k is the constant which we will choose, sorry, I'll, uh, where is k coming? Yeah, 
alpha n a plus alpha n by b plus c n, I want it to be less than or equal to alpha n. Right? And there is such an alpha that satisfies this is what I want to show, then I would be done showing linear time. Right? Okay. I mean, you can, you can also expand this recurrence. So, how, how do you show this? Let's say if I put n by 2, how do you show this whole thing solves to linear? It's cn plus cn by 2 plus cn by 4, and it's a geometric series, so it's 2cn. Similarly, you can just go and you know expand it out and write your recursion tree and, and, and the whole idea of again you'll get some geometric series that will add up to linear. Okay? But I'm just giving you, a, you know, yet another proof by induction and, and particularly to see why I need this fact that 1 by a plus 1 by b is less, strictly less than 1. Okay? So I want to show this. Okay, So let's get rid of n. So I want alpha into 1 by a plus 1 by b or rather or I choose alpha to be greater than or equal to c is this running time whatever um, you know time I spend on this step. So I, if I choose alpha to be greater than or equal to this then that will satisfy this inequality. I just that's all I need. So and you can see why I want one by a plus one by b to be strictly less than one. Okay. Yes, I don't see some happy faces. Is it clear? So essentially, all we are saying is that we know that if you spend linear time and a fraction of the input, it's also linear. You can generalize this recurrence to spend linear time and multiple fractions, but they all add up to less than one, just like this half was less than one. Then also this whole thing solves to linear time. Okay? And um, you can prove by induction, you can prove by solving recursion tree and so on. And so now this gave them a little more leeway now, right? Let's come back here. So now I have I'm armed with some such recurrence. Right? So I come here now. I don't need to find this such an element in CN time. I can actually use CN plus another recurrence, another recursive thing, right? So suppose I manage to find it in, let's say, CN plus some t of n by 5 or something. Okay? And after doing this, it so happens. So, how much, um, what would be the, what can you say about the, suppose that element I'm looking for is in this range. Then what can you say about the maximum size of the portion where I'm recursing? How much can that be maximum? Hmm? Who said 7 by 10? Yeah, okay. Is it clear? Because I, I end up throwing at least 3 n by 10. Whether I recurse here or recurse here, I end up throwing at least. If I manage to find such an element, I have to explain how you do that. If I manage to find such an element, not just in CN, suppose I also spend a little bit more time, then what will be the running time? This is the overall running time. Okay? Now, n by 5 is okay because if you add this fraction and that fraction, this is 2n by 10 and 7n by 10, you know, just less than 1. Okay? And you can play around with various parameters and see why it, why it works. Okay? So now I'm going to just explain this step, how to do this. Okay? Then that, that's their magic first step and after that everything else falls. Okay? So now I'll tell you, that's this big picture of blocks of five doing all these median of medians and all these. So that because you spend, you find such an element where, where you can throw away a fraction of the elements, that fraction is not just any fraction, this fraction plus this fraction add up to less than 1. Then you have a, a linear time solution. Okay? So how do they find this? And that, let's just go back and do the same. So step 1 of The goal is this. Okay. After this, I'm going to partition all the elements. That's n minus one, and then um, I know that if I manage to find such an element, then I end up my recursive 
portion to have size at most 7 n by 10. Okay. So, what do they do? Well, and let us go back and draw this picture. So, divide your input into blocks of size 5. Okay. So, there are n by 5 blocks. Right. Again, what if n is not a multiple of 5? Then maybe you know, keep a bunch of elements aside and then do your comparisons later on. We, we won't worry about these details, but can be worked out. Because my goal is to just get to you know, how to get this in this much time. Okay. So step one. So divide the list into blocks of size 5 each and find the median of each block. Okay, so the median in the out of these 5 elements compare, do your comparisons, find the median. How do I find the median? Well, do whatever you want. You can sort because this is a constant number. You know, if you want to spend 10 comparisons on this, feel free, no problem. At the moment, we are not worrying about the constant in the linear time we are aiming for, but that's for later. You can optimize it. So this takes, even if I just do sorting, I will get n by 5 into 10n, sorry, 10. So this is like 2n. Okay. Next step find the median of medians. So I have done these comparisons and I got these medians. How do I find this? This is too many elements, n by 5 elements. How do I find the median of medians? Well, I am allowed this leeway, right? So recursively. That median is that x, and then you follow through that. Okay, then you you got your x. I claim that that x you got satisfies this. Okay, then you can partition x, compare everybody, find its actual rank, and recurse on the appropriate portion. Now you'll argue that the x I got actually is somewhere in close to the middle. See, the problem with the quick select was that. The pivot you picked comes so close to the boundary, then you have not done your split carefully, right? But I claim that by doing this little pre-processing, I managed to find an x which is not too far close to the boundaries, extremes. And why is this? Well, let's talk about, let's see how many, what is the property of x. There are at least n by 10 elements in each side. Because this is a median of n by 5 elements, there are at least n by 10 elements smaller than this, at least n by 10 elements larger than this. and not that, not that much alone. For every element larger than this, there are two more elements larger than that, that element, right? Because I have picked th that guy was a median of some five elements. So for every element you have larger than that x, there are also two more elements larger than that. So actually there are, you know, x has at least 3n by 10 elements larger and by the same argument at least 3n by 10 elements smaller. Okay, so is it clear for every, I mean there are n over 10 elements smaller than this, n over 10 elements larger than this, okay. Now suppose here this was one element larger than this. But remember, this itself is a median of this block of five elements. What does that mean? This element has two elements larger than that and two elements smaller than that, right? So in particular, for anything larger than that, larger than x, there are two more elements larger than that element and hence larger than x. So all the three n over 10 elements are larger than x. Similarly, for every element smaller than x, there are two more elements smaller than that element and hence smaller than x. So there are 3n over 2 elements smaller than which means that's exactly what I wanted that you know I've 
pick x in a way that at least, right? It's not, you know, at, at least some 3n by 10 elements are here, and at least 3n by 10 elements are here. So after you do this split and you're going to recurse, you are guaranteed that some 3n by 10 elements are thrown out, at most 7n by 10 elements left, and then you know you can add them all less than. Okay? Now that's it. That's that's end of linear time algorithm. So this this was a um, Bloom Floyd Prod reverse Tarzan linear time algorithm. And um, so it's you know, you get the idea of why what they were after. You know, this is this is the case of recurrence relation driving an algorithm. Okay. We saw examples even in the morning where you know the four to n by t n by two was not enough for matrix multiply uh, integer multiplication, and you have you know where to go and improve, right? You, so it's it's like recurrence relations and the algorithm going hand in hand. So let me just stop with a couple of exercises. Um, well, the exercises are why blocks of five, right? Um, it's it's good to choose an odd number so that the median is very well defined. Uh, you don't have to worry about this or that. So let's choose an odd number. Does it work if I pick blocks of size three? Well, we have the entire machinery there. Let's go and analyze it, right? If if I choose blocks of size three, then what happens? How much time? This is a linear time, whatever it is. Okay, not may not be two n, but something else. This would be t n by three. So what would be my recurrence? Some c n plus. Okay. And what what are these numbers? How, what can I guarantee? To n by three, because it's a median of n by three elements, so n by six elements are in each side, and each has one more. So two n by six, it's, it's n by three is what you can guarantee to throw out. So two n by three will be left out. So what you have is this, and this doesn't give you linear because the fractions add up to exactly one. Okay. Does seven work? So if log sizes are three, if they are seven, let's see. So I'm doing a median of the medians. Let's see. So n by fourteen on each side, and four. So four n by fourteen. That's 2n by 7 thrown out, so 5n by 7 left out, which is fine. Is this right? I mean, I just quickly did. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So that that works. But then you can you know plug in and see the constants vary. Okay, 5 gives you better constant than 7, I think. Um, yeah. So this is this was the original, you know, 1973 median finding algorithm and since then it has gone through evolution of improvements on the constants and currently um, you are saying from the morning? No. Order statistics is by? Well this is finding median whatever that is. I don't understand order statistics by pruning. This is a problem of finding median. Okay, and so the current best bound, um, and the lower bound is also an interesting. I mean, we Pandurangan mentioned about three n by two minus two as an upper bound for finding min and max, and there is a matching lower bound using some adversary arguments that can show that any algorithm will necessarily take that many comparisons in the worst case. For median, currently uh, the upper bound is. Less than or equal to three minus epsilon n, and there is a lower bound 
of some 2 plus epsilon n. I mean, epsilon is a fixed constant. So I think this is some 2.95 n and and 2.05 n lower bound or something. This is still an interesting open problem in in narrowing down down the gaps. And you know, there have been several papers on on this about um, improving the constant and improving the lower bound. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop here. Any any questions, comments? How much is the constant speed in this? More than? Oh yeah, it's it's some two digit for sure. <laughs> at, at least ten or this C. Yeah. Oh, you're saying what is this C? This C, you have it, right? The, for the 5, it's just 2n. There's nothing else. There's 2n plus n. 3n. So it's about 30n, is it? That's your calculation? OK. OK. Thank you.